was a ball, it was a blast. It's a shame it couldn't last, but every chapter has to end, you must agree. It was a joy, it was sublime, a splendid way to earn a dime for a dirty rotten guy like me. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. One of my great regrets as a connoisseur of the musical theater is that I missed our guest's iconic performance in Miss Saigon. So I'm awfully happy that he's back on Broadway and a smash hit all over again in a radically different role. Here to introduce him, my co-host Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Jonathan Price won a Tony Award for his portrayal of the pimp in Miss Saigon. It was a really a great, great performance. He is back on Broadway now in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, having replaced John Lithgow, and there's already talk that he's going to get another Tony Award for his performance. Jonathan Price, welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. A Tony Award the first time around. Yep. Now, like 15, 16 years later, a lot of talk about a Tony nomination again. Where have you been all this time? You seem to triumph every time you come to Broadway. Uh, it's been a long time between the two engagements. Yeah, well, it, it's waiting for the right project. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but surely after your success in Miss Saigon, people were falling all over themselves to entice oh, they, you to do something on Broadway. Yeah, they, they were, but it's, it's, <laughs> something, uh, it's looking for something I w want to do. And uh, uh, it's, it's quite personal because the, my, uh, I have a family and mm -hmm. we live in London and it's very difficult to, uh, they're a bit older now, so it, it's, it's easier to leave them. So you um, made a, a decision though after Miss Saigon when people wanted you to come back to Broadway that I've got kids and um, I don't yeah. want to be in New York when they're in London. Yeah, it, it, that was part of it. It was, it was really difficult. And also there were projects in, uh, in London that I was, have, have done in between. Mm -hmm. um, Oliver, my Yeah, they have a little theater world there. Yeah, right. theater world you've there. had a few successes yeah. in the yeah. West End, it's true, in those intervening years. Yeah. But um, it, it, is, it, it has been, uh, I've wanted to come back very much because I, I enjoyed it so much. I've been here three times before, comedians in 76. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sci a Saigon, accidental death of an anarchist. It was it's, the it, yes, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's great to work in. It's it, I've been looking forward to coming back. How do they lure you back uh, for this show? Money. <laughs> <laughs> huge, huge sums of money. So no, you turn I, them down a few times, and they keep coming back with a bigger offer. Back, yeah. um, <laughs> I came to see the show last year. I was in town, um, and John Lithgow is a great friend of mine. We've been friends for thirty years, ever since we did comedians together. Mm -hmm. And I simply went to see the show that my friend was in. I knew nothing about it. And uh, we went and had dinner afterwards. He said he was having a wonderful time doing it. It was obvious that he was having a great time when I saw him on stage. And uh, I liked the show very much, but that was it. I didn't think anything more about it. Went back to London. And then a few months later, the producers called and said, you saw the show, John's leaving. Would you like to take over? And I'd never ever it used to be kind of a not the thing to do to uh, yeah you would never step to take in over and, yeah, yeah, yeah. in a role and uh, I, I, I thought hard about it but I also thought I'd have to see it again so I came back mm -hmm. to see it this time sitting there imagining Yourself. myself on stage and imagining myself with Norbert mm -hmm. and I think that was one of the strong attractions for, for doing the piece was to get to work with somebody as uh, energetic and as lively and as creative as, as Norbert. So uh, I said, yeah. It's interesting what you say about it, it was not the thing to do, replacing someone in the show, because um, Eileen Atkins, um, a colleague of yours from London, yeah. is, uh, uh, has replaced Cherry Jones in Doubt, and she was on the show a couple of weeks ago, and she said, you know, I would, I've never replaced anyone mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the thing to do. Yeah. Her feeling, though, was that she felt she's reached a certain age where you don't get these really great roles, and so when one comes along, she wants to do it, whether or not she's, you know, the first person to do it or the second yeah. person to do it. Yeah. I mean, is there something to that? Um, <laughs> Maybe no, it's different for no, women, different. Than, for a woman <laughs> than a man. <laughs> um, I, it just seemed the, the right thing to do. It, uh, in the sort of grand scheme of things, the roles I've played on stage, um, I've. It's not. It's been a long time that I've since I've done anything which was as outwardly comedic yeah. as this, and that's that's what I want to do. And. Uh, Having done the last thing I did on stage is, you know, was the goat in yep. London. Yeah, terrific um, performance, was I, which I caught. Thank you. Um, Not a musical comedy that play, though. No, but it, I often thought it would make a wonderful opera. Ah, I think it's sort of a chamber opera. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, Eileen scrupulously avoided seeing Cherry's interpretation, but you had yeah. seen John Lithgow, and yet you've you've 
reinvented, to br bring that term, the role you're yeah. doing in a very different way. How do you avoid keeping out shades of John Lithgow? Um, he's taller. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. It, uh, I'm, uh, I, I didn't consciously, once I'd seen John do it, I, I certainly didn't think about it again or consciously try to avoid what John had done. And what was wonderful about the company and Jack O'Brien and uh, your director, the director, <laughs> and everyone in the company, they wanted, uh, they were ready after a year mm -hmm. uh, for new input, mm -hmm. and um, they were very welcoming. And the only thing that I, I'd learnt the music before I came because that that would save time. Mm -hmm. um, and the only thing I didn't really want to change was the choreography because mm -hmm. it, it kind of it was it's good choreography is great and it fits in with everything everybody else is doing uh, but there was room within the scenes for different nuances and re you and Norbert have you invented business with Norbert yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah but it, it it was it was fairly organic it was like starting again it was approaching a new for me it was approaching a new text and a new part anyway mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it, it's worked out well, pretty and when they well. Open, pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> Do you read those reviews? I mean, you got across the board rave reviews. Do you? I I wasn't going to, and uh, last night um, before our kind of official opening, mm -hmm. they the press office had had the, all the re reviews in, mm -hmm. and uh, I said I wasn't going to read them. So, and I said, but that's going to be difficult because if nobody speaks to me, I'm not that bad. Right. And if they say they're good, <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah, say, yeah. Well, no, how, how good? And they're never as good as you want them to be, you know. <laughs> So uh, he said, well, what if I tell you they're good? He said, and I said, yeah, but, you know, that if you don't tell me they're good, I mean, they means they're bad. He said, no, they're good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that was it. And so I, I read uh, uh, Ben Brantley. Mm -hmm. um, then you went to the party happy. And I went to the party very happy. So I have been to parties uh, <laughs> where oh. people have left the room. Really? Oh. Now, wait, I've <laughs> seen a number of your performances. And I, have you ever gotten a bad review? Um... I mean, you're always hailed, whether it's a dramatic part you're playing or a musical theater performance. Yeah, I've, I know I've been um, fortunate. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, no. They, so they've you don't been. really know what it's like to get a bad review. But the show's oh, gotten bad reviews. What was that Alex Cohn thing you did uh, way back? Anarchist. Yes. Anarchist did, didn't, uh, it was a great show, but it was yeah, in the wrong theater. They didn't understand it, was, it yeah. It was, uh, it, it didn't work. And that was, the room emptied then. Yes, the room emptied yeah. then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that an interesting difference, though, between um, uh, being uh, in a Broadway show or being in a West End show, that there's just more, I don't know, drama in terms of what the critics have to say, uh, that a room can empty so quickly in New York if the reviews are bad? I've, n I've been to a few opening night parties yeah. in the West End. I never get that sense that the critics have as much power there no, as they and do also here. The, I mean, here it happens that the critics have... Um, which is a good thing. They come in over three or four days. Right. They're not all in London. They're there on one night right, generally, right. and nobody knows what the review is going to be until the next day. Whereas here, there's an awareness of what the reviews are, and by the time you get to that official first night party, they know they've, they've had them in. Yeah, um, London, it's not quite the same. Right, but uh, also, I, I don't know. There's a, there's a great se greater sense of uh, of pressure here too. I think maybe it's. It's becoming as expensive in London, but it's, it's so hugely expensive to put a show on now. A few of the um, English actors we've had over the years on this show have said that they like working in New York because uh, there is more pressure and things are more dramatic. I mean, when you succeed the way you have done on yeah. in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, it's, all, it's a sort of a bigger thing for some reason than it is yeah. if in the West End. If you fail, it's a bigger thing here, too, yeah. than it yeah. is in London. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah. 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 It's, um, well, also, you're here. There's a sense of occasion of, in yourself that you're here, and you, you're, you're sort of radars out a bit more for that, uh, for how people respond to you. In London, you, you can go home. <laughs> yeah, <quite> nice. <laughs> right. uh, you've got that security. But I, no, I've, uh, I, I, I've loved working here. I had a wonderful time doing Miss Saigon. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's there's no place like it if you're in a hit show. Yeah. It's, it's great. Yeah, um, you're one of the few actors who can do the goat at some point, a serious dramatic part, and then you can jump into a lightweight musical comedy. When did when did you become a musical theater actor? Did you start out wanting to do musical theater, or did you start out as you know serious RSC, going to do the classics all the time um, kind of an actor? No, I started out uh, in political theater. Mm -hmm. in uh, in England. As soon as I left um, the, the Royal Academy, I went to work at the Everyman Theatre in mm -hmm. Liverpool. 
which was a repertory company where you could stay for as long as they wanted you. You'd stay a year, two years, three years, and you'd play a, a variety of different roles. You were played as, as cast. Mm -hmm. And the, the great thing about the Everyman, it was an ensemble, but it had a political uh, point of view. It was a, a socialist left-wing Who were the playwrights you were doing then? Uh? Um, well, we did um, a lot of uh, contemporary playwrights, uh, John McGrath, yeah. um, Willie Russell, oh, Alan yeah. Bleasdale, yeah. Yeah. Um, Chris Bond, as well as uh, classical theatre. Mm -hmm. But when we would do classical theatre, like I did Richard III, I did Lear, I played Edgar, it was always informed by the political viewpoint of the, of the company. Mm -hmm. And we did new shows that were generally appealing to, um, or were made to appeal to unsophisticated uh, new audiences from the outskirts of Liverpool. And um, it was a working class kind of a we, we left, tried left to wing working class sort of a yeah. But, uh, natu it was naturally middle class because right. it was a theatre. Right, of course, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> but you tried to. <laughs> but we we brought in the new audience, and in order to do that, it, it wasn't. We would never patronise the audience, but. Um, there were shows that uh, had uh, the dramatic content, but we were backed by rock bands on stage. <laughs> oh. So there was always music involved. It was a kind of Brechtian approach to it, a very modern, yeah. upbeat Brechtian approach to theatre. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when uh, music became part of what I did and what we all did. Were you a singer by just... I've always been a singer. Really? Yeah, really? When you're a child, yeah. So. Really? And you studied it professionally? Or no, just no. But I've always been able to sing. But when I was at drama school, wrong, you, yeah. you got uh, singing training. Lessons. What was the first And musical? I got my first job because I could sing at the Everyman. Oh, I see. Uh, in order to play the singer narrator in Caucasian chalk oh, circle. Oh, sure, sure. Sure, interesting. And so uh, that's how I started. Anyway. But the, what was the first sort of proper musical that you, that you did? Where Miss Saigon. Miss, you're kidding, really? Yeah, <laughs> no. That's what uh, I guess I remember that. Yeah. You'd never done a proper West End Broadway musical no, before. I, never, until I didn't go to them even. I didn't well, you pulled, like it, them. You, you pulled <laughs> it off pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> now, when you did Miss Saigon, <laughs> there was a huge flap here. Yeah. You, you may recall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That made you more famous than anything yeah. else, that flap. I because, think. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, that they wanted it, the Actors Equity, was it wanted, it, or a segment of Actors Equity wanted yeah, it. Because when I arrived for this, for this equity. show, Equity said, well, you know he has to join Equity. And the producer <laughs> said, I think you'll find he's already a member. <laughs> so, anyway, that. That we should say this, you tell, you what Susan is referring to is at the time of Miss Saigon, um, the Asian actors in this city felt that the Eurasian character you were playing should be played by an Asian, an Asian actor, an Asian American yeah, actor, yeah. not a Caucasian. And of course, that was a big, gigantic scandal and uproar at the mm. time. Um, it seems to me, though, that we've kind of moved beyond that political correctness, if you will, in, in, in the theater. And well, we've moved beyond it because we learned from that experience, yeah. I think. And it's a, it was a very valid argument to have had. Yeah, yeah. And uh, very positive things came out of it. I mean, of course, they, they, the people who were making the protest um, were, on the one hand, absolutely right in what they were saying. And they wanted uh, more opportunities for um, ethnic minority actors to play uh, Roles, not just that they were ethnically suited for, but right. any kind of role. Right. And um, I th it was a very good argument to have had. I mean, it. it um, How did you feel at the time? Did you? I mean, did because here, now here you were a left wing actor to start, so you had those yeah. sympathies. Did you feel any kind of guilt, or did it undermine you, or how did you process it at the um, time? It, it was frustrating because I was in London and couldn't take part in the uh, in the arguments, as it were, and. Uh, You'd read things and you'd think, why are they saying such horrible things about me? <laughs> <laughs> if only they know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was you. the everyman, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I always knew that uh, it was a good argument to have and that if, if it came up positively, then once they saw what I did and how I did it right. and how it wasn't demeaning in any way to any kind of race, um, other than the, to the human race. But when I got here, I got huge support, and especially from the, the Saigon company itself and right. the theatrical community. And and from that, it's I'm not making myself out to be the the, the sort of uh, role model, but it's it's like um, you know the guy who ran the first four minute mile pretty mm -hmm. soon. Everyone can, can run the four minute mile. And it was like, Russia, Bam, it was well set. Uh, it, it did give people the opportunity and give people the chance to 
to show what they could do and uh and I think it's rarely been played by a Caucasian actor. I don't. Since. Yeah, I don't yeah. think since you played yeah. it, yeah. I can think of any one uh, a Caucasian actor playing it on Broadway at least. No, or they even hedged their bets there. Yeah. You were. Yeah. But that, that, but I think that there still is, you know. A, and you a, think it could, could still be played by a Caucasian actor, right? Absolutely. Otherwise, there was no point in having that argument about whether actors right. should be able to play any. You know, I I don't sleep with goats. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> You're British. It was that once. <laughs> Just that one time. Ironically, though, uh, you know, all of many of the people who were protesting Miss Saigon later wound up getting plenty of work out of Miss Saigon yeah. as it became yeah. this global hit and employed more Asian actors, I think, than yeah. any other show in the history of uh, in the history of yeah. Broadway. Yeah. So I don't think you'll have this trouble in um, in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Scoundrels now, this much. is one where you can really sort of cut loose. This show always it was originally David Niven in the in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you draw anything from David Niven? I mean, it is a kind of, it is a David Niven character part. David Niven, it was Michael Caine. No, 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 it was no, David Niven originally. David Niven, and, and what was that film called? Yeah, I've forgotten the name of the movie. Now. It's... Booth? It was David Niven and it was uh, Marlon Brando. Mm were the two uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels in the movie, which Michael is set in the, in the French Riviera. I am so impressed. Yeah. yeah. And then it was remade. And then yeah, it was remade. It was remade. Yeah. And then it was remade. Yeah. But, but I mean, you strike me as... You know, I'd rather carry a little more of David Niven than Michael Caine. <laughs> <laughs> what a is that? A little more of him. <laughs> <laughs> appeals to me more. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can see sort of David Niven in your... Just in your, your, your physicality. Really? Yeah. No, I never thought of that. Really? There you go. I was not a bad actor to be... Uh, no. No, no. A wonderful style. Uh -huh. The eyebrow. Yeah. Did you yeah. watch the? We we'll have to put the title of this movie underneath. Yes, the well, thing. We, 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 yeah. Did you watch this it movie? It could be a competition. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Did you watch this movie whose title we cannot remember no. before you? No, you no, didn't do it. I haven't seen it, <laughs> and I had never seen uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. The, the Michael the, Caine. The Michael Caine. Steve version. Martin. Yeah. Never seen it. Um, so when I saw the musical, mm -hmm. the Denouement, was a great surprise for me. I had no <laughs> idea what what was going on. Oh, uh, really? So you yeah, were shocked by it? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and I've, uh, in my nights of insomnia here, I'm flicking channels. I've, I, it's, it, they show it in the middle of the night. So I've seen oh, so bits now you've caught of, up? Uh, yeah, just bits of it. The Michael Caine one. Yeah, not the, uh, but the musical's better, much better. Th th has Michael Caine inspired you in any way? No. <laughs> it's his own particular kind of performance. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> cut that bit. That's right. Cut that bit. Um, but he's not a viewer. All right. <laughs> it's an interesting, though, it's a throwback, this musical, and the movie itself, too, that sort of is being set on the French Riviera. Yeah. A kind of, sort of a fun time if you see those sort of early 60s movies, even like the Pink Panther Clouseau movies with yeah. like George... Um, 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 Sanders yeah. in one of them. I yeah. mean, you know, it's a kind of character you don't see much anymore. Yeah. So that must make fun. And there's, for a, the play. there's a kind of timelessness to the to the look of the piece. I was I was kind of when I first sat down in the audience, I was kind of shocked by. I thought it was a strange set, but it made the, as it unfolds, it makes sense. It it looks, it's kind of like the 30s or 40s musicals yeah. with these palm trees and you know gaudily dressed dancing girls. And uh, there's a timelessness to the production. The clothes, my clothes. Um, and now, but they're not quite now. They're a bit more classically mm -hmm. cut, and uh, I, I think that's a, that's a uh, a lot of fun. It's also, fun when you're beating Norbert with that stick, it's quite something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> the goat, the stick, I yeah. <laughs> and it's nice to play someone who gets to wear nicely tailored suits. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know? yeah. you're an actor usually, and you only get to put on nicely tailored suits for talk shows. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, you got great acclaim um, as Henry Higgins in uh, My Fair Lady mm -hmm. in uh, London, and there's been a lot of talk of it uh, eventually coming to New York. Um, do you think it's going to come here, and will you come with it to play that part? Um, I, d I don't know. Uh, I'm uh, uh, always, always talking to Cameron about, about doing it. Cameron McIntosh, the yeah. producer of it. So yeah. he's, uh, he's back in two, and I th th there's talk now it'll be... Um, at the end of 2007, mm -hmm. but I um, I kind of made the choice to to do this at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, it it has shades of my fair lady. It does. Yeah. I've said that. Um, oh, yeah, he's teaching. He's teaching yeah. the boy to be a c yeah. great now, con man. Wasn't there a problem with your leading lady in that production of of, of my fair lady? Um, Susan asked so innocently. <laughs> Jonathan, well, we've yeah. got you here. We yeah. heard uh, Maureen well, McCutcheon, I think your name was, a pop yeah. singer. Martin Martin McCutcheon. See, we don't um, know her. See, we don't know who she is. No, so she's we, not here. Well, she, um, a young uh, 
British actress who was a big hit on a, a soap, EastEnders, mm. right. who then became a pop star and then uh, started out in the role of uh, Eliza. And uh, I say started out because we got to the, the press night and then she got sick and was off for uh, initially six weeks and then then never really came back properly. <laughs> and then, and so I had a number of uh, Elizas. The understudy took over uh, the night, the final preview before the press night. And uh, a poor girl had never, she was 18, she'd yeah. never rehearsed with me. She was in the ensemble. Mm -hmm. And we had 20 minutes uh, to just run when we knew that uh, Miss McCutcheon wasn't appearing to run through Was that through a horrifying scene. experience or was there uh, some was kind of stimulation? It was exciting. <laughs> it was exciting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was. It was. Uh, um, and she was just great. Yeah. And it was the classic chorus girl who steps Do up. Do we from, know her now? Um, Alex J. Oh, right. Um, who then went into. Uh, she went right. into Mamma Mia, various things. But and, weren't you making speeches about. Well, uh, I did after. Um, is that at the time. We we had a uh, we had three of them on the go because the oh. we had the understudy then the understudy's understudy <laughs> and Martine <laughs> who would show sometimes Martine would show up right occasionally for a performance she would occasionally show up yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we got to we got to Tuesday where um, Martine had been on so then it got I think and then it got to the Wednesday matinee where the understudy was on and then the Wednesday evening the understudy was sick. <laughs> so the understudy's understudy was going on. I also, by that time, had still never rehearsed with her. And I thought that the audience should know something, and I, because I wanted them to be on her side, right, really. Right, right, right. Um, and I went out front at the beginning of the play, and I said, um, uh, blah, 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 you were about to see uh, uh, the debut of... Um, <laughs> I've got no name. <laughs> and I said, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is your first Eliza. It's my second today <laughs> and my third in two days. <laughs> and if there's anybody in the audience who would like to uh, apply for <laughs> playing the role of Eliza, there are application forms. There. Anyway, it just made it a lot easier. Um, I can it, understand. it was tough. It was I can tough. understand your reluctance to, uh, yeah. to doing my affair. I think Cameron will find you and Eliza oh, yeah. a little who will come yeah. who will show yeah. up for work. Yeah. But this is something, though, that can happen more in the theater now because the theater is drawing not only from your traditional stage actors, but in order to sell tickets, is drawing from the pop music world <laughs> and the television yeah. world. And do you see a real difference between, let's say, uh, the work ethic that the typical theater actor has as opposed to the pop, pop, pop <laughs> idol and um, the soap opera actor? Well, I've, I've not, yeah, I, I've had that experience with My Fair Lady, which was uh, a completely different work ethic, and, uh, and it's a shock. I mean, I know you have most of your days free as an actor. Right. Uh, but that sort of um, two and a half, three hours is incredibly intense. Mm -hmm. um, and eight times a week is uh, it's, it's quite a shock to people if they've if they've never done it before I mean it's it's what I've done Your all my life, life. Yeah. and that's not to say I won't have shows out if I'm sick or you know it's 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 difficult singing mm -hmm. it's quite a big thing uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels mm -hmm. I have with it um, and it's uh, uh, it's um it's uh, that has come as a shock to me because <laughs> when I saw it I thought oh they're yeah, it looks Norbert's light, set. fun, you can yeah. swing and Norbert's by. doing all the hard work, yeah. I thought. <laughs> right. And I'll come in in my nice suit and I'll uh, be suave and debonair. And then, but it's, uh, it's one of the hardest working things. When you're not on stage, you're changing mm. right. to get back on. I, I don't, I've got a very nicely redecorated dressing room. It's got mm. a beautiful sofa in it. I never see it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm in the wings, wiping the sweat off, waiting <laughs> to get back on. Right. Yeah. If you start missing performances, though, it'll be yeah. ironic and watch out. I know. Oh, I'll I bring know. Martine in to, her, to <laughs> get her take yeah. on, the, on, your, yeah. on your work ethic. Uh, but it's a terrific performance in Dirty Round Scoundrels. Really? Jonathan Price, a wonderful, uh, uh, serious, dramatic actor and a great musical comedy actor. Welcome Reinventing back. the role. Welcome back to New York. And Thanks. Um, uh, have a good time while you're here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for being our guest tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good. Good. Thanks. Right.